All right, let's have a look at some basic um, marker setup with the Ragdoll. So in this case, I have a, a regular old Maya rig. Uh, the controllers are, uh, you know, they should be familiar. Like it's just regular NURBS controls. Uh, there's like IKFK switches on the legs. Uh, so you can do things like this. And uh, for this demo, I'm just going to assign some um, uh, overlapping motion, some physics onto the, uh, the upper arm. Uh, so the way Ragdoll works is that you select the controls that you want to be influenced by physics. So I'm going to select the uh, clavicle control, followed by the upper arm, lower arm, and hand. Uh, and then I'm going to go to Ragdoll, Assign and Connect. Uh, and that will assign a physics component uh, called a marker, and it will connect them together uh, in the order that I have selected, uh, that I've selected them in the viewport. Uh, so as soon as I do that, you get these colored shapes. Uh, they're sort of overlapping the model at the moment. Uh, and if you hit play, uh, you'll see they, they do a slight, they start dropping with gravity, uh, just ever so slightly. Uh, and if I were to lower the, um, the pose stiffness, which is essentially a, a animation glue, uh, because what it, what it attempts to do is it, is it tries to follow your animation uh, as closely as possible. And, and that includes during playback. So if I were to set keyframes on this lower arm, for example, and I go over here and I set another keyframe, say over here, uh, as soon as I hit play now, uh, the physics components, uh, the markers, they will try and reach that pose. And likewise, if I were to move it back, it tries to reach it. Uh, so now we have some basic overlapping motion on this uh, arm component. I'll just move these keys. Uh, and this is the this is essentially how Ragdoll works. Uh, everything that you do with Ragdoll is going to be uh, in this manner. Uh, so for um, well, uh, yeah, and like I mentioned, you can. Uh, go ahead and you can tweak the the animation glue, uh, the pose stiffness. If it's even lower, uh, it will have less of an effect uh, on the physics. And ultimately, if it's zero, it will just not be affected by the animation at all. It will just it will just do uh, what physics tells it to do. Like it has no correlation anymore with the uh, with the original animation. And, and likewise, if it's a high value, so the default is ten, it will try and follow. Uh, you know, relatively closely, it still has some fall off, uh, and then you can control the um, there's a, the bounciness uh, of the uh, of the um, of how closely it follows. Because you can see that there's some there's some uh, like towards the end here, it sort of eases into the uh, to the final pose, uh, and that easing uh, is called damping. So if there's no damping, uh, then it will it will not ease. It will be like a, a spring <laughs> that never comes to rest. So you always want you always want some damping. Uh, so let's put it at say a quite low value. Uh, you would get like a robotic sort of spring-like effect. You know, but this is what you would use if this character was say a robot and it was moving like a robot. Uh, and a default value of one uh, is tuned to being like a human fleshy uh, limb. Uh, so let's uh, let's see if we can apply physics to the whole character. I'm gonna go right all system delete all physics it's sort of a shorthand way of just clearing anything right all related in your scene <clears throat> so now we're back to uh, to what we saw before so i'm just going to reset this to zero uh, and then we'll start with the uh, hip and work our way up the spine go assign and connect uh, and now we're going to select uh, we're going to select an existing marker uh, that we want to branch off of because i want the arm to be connected to this spine that we just made uh, so I'll select the torso again, uh, that's already got a marker on it, and then go out into the clavicle, upper arm, lower arm, hand. I'll go assign and connect. Uh, and then likewise for the uh, the other side, I'll hit G this time to repeat that. Uh, and for the legs, uh, in this case, I'm going to assign it to the FK controller. Uh, I'll cover IK a little bit later. Uh, FK is the simplest uh, option. So I'll do the spine and work my way down the leg, spine, work my way down the other leg. Uh, and now we've assigned markers to, to the whole character. So if I hit play now, uh, we'll get some, you know, we'll get an effect. You know, it does drop, like the arms drop, the legs don't really do much. Uh, and because everything is uh, overlapping, uh, well actually, uh, before I do anything else, I want to I wanna adjust these shapes to, to better fit the, the character that I've just made. Because you can see how some of these shapes are they're very narrow, even though the character is much broader. Uh, the arms are doing a uh, you know a decent job matching the uh, the shape of the mesh. The hands are a bit big. Uh, the feet are are much too big, 
and the uh, the thighs are a little bit too small. Uh, so I'm going to go ragdoll manipulator, and this puts you in sort of a, a tweak, a tweaking mode, if you will. Uh, and if I go to the shaped mode uh, button, uh, then I can start selecting these um, these shapes, and I can start tweaking them. So now I can adjust the the radius and the length of the head, say to sort of try and um, align that with the actual head. I'll do the same thing for the spine, the torso, uh, and now we're starting to see that they, 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 they match the shape a little bit better. I'll do the same thing for the clavicle, and here you'll notice that you also have symmetry, uh, which is, uh, it will look at the, the, the pose that it was in as you assign things. So if your character is in the T pose when you start assign and connect, uh, it will remember uh, the um, symmetry, even though the anime, the character might be posed later on. So for the hand, let's make them a tiny bit shorter. Uh, the legs, uh, they're looking pretty good. Uh, the feet, much too big. And uh, I'll show you how to uh, make these shapes a little more accurate. Because right now they are they are uh, sphere, you know, cylinders. Uh, and what we really, you know, especially for feet. We want them to be quite uh, accurate, quite uh, aligned to, to the ground. Um, if we're, you know, if we're simulating feet, so this looks pretty good. So now when we hit play, uh, we get a similar effect. Uh, and at this point, we can take the whole solver and just offset the uh, the render of it. So we're not actually changing any uh, sort of position in the simulation. We're just changing the sort of the render part, so we can see these side by side now. Uh, so next, what I would probably do is I would go in and I would start replacing some of these capsules with the actual um, geometry on the character. So as I mentioned for the feet, we kind of want these to be the actual geometry for the feet. So I'm going to go to the geometry layer here and just not reference it so I, I can start selecting these. Uh, and I want to I select the, the control that I've assigned to. Uh, and we can see that it's assigned in the channel box here. It has got this output marker node. Uh, so with this selected, I can then shift select a mesh. In this case, I'm going to use this mesh, and it can be any mesh. It doesn't really matter where it is. It will make a copy of whatever you select and uh, and make that the collision shape. Uh, in this case, they are in a different hierarchy as well, so it doesn't uh, hierarchy doesn't matter. And then I'll go right all uh, utilities replace mesh. And now you can see that here. Now we're using that mesh uh, as a collider. And if, in fact, it's not the exact mesh. It's making a, an optimized collision shape for this. It's, a, it's called a convex hull. And likewise for the other foot, and then the, you know, you can, you can do this for all of them, so I'll just, I'll just select all of these guys, including the hand, uh, the upper arm. So you notice I just drag select over these, which selects both the control and the mesh, and just hit G to, uh, to repeat that process. Same for the head, and, and there we go. So now we've replaced all the meshes. So now we got the now we get the most accurate contacts, and you'll notice that he's still he's still standing up, um, uh, and that's because the uh, by default the first control that you select uh, is going to be in a, um, a kinematic state, uh, meaning that it won't actually apply gravity to this controller. Because uh, if you remember, we assigned to the hip first and then move our way up to the uh, spine. Uh, so this controller is going to have this behavior called kinematic. Uh, which means that it will copy the animation, like whatever whatever pose this is in, it will just copy that into the solver without actually changing it. So gravity is not applied, uh, no forces are applied. Uh, it will just copy, it will just do exactly what the animation is doing. And I can demonstrate that by just setting a few keyframes. Say if I set it over here, and maybe uh, you know over here, you can see it's, it. It will take the the hip and just make an exact replica inside of the simulation. And everything else is attached to that, and which is why they also follow around. Uh, at this point, we can we can lower the, the animation animation glue, and we'll get somewhat more of an effect, you know, a little bit more. Uh, so here we have a, a very relaxed mannequin character. Uh, at this point, we can spot a few problems. So first of all, uh, he's doing a lot of self-intersections. Uh, and that's because, per default, uh, the uh, character will be set to uh, to not have any self collisions, so I'll just enable those on this uh, group node, uh, and the group node gets created uh, with the first uh, assignments that you make. So remember, I made I selected the uh, spine, 
work my way up the uh, well the, the hip and then work my way up the spine. It will then create the group that contains that spine and anything you attach to it, in this case the arms and the legs, they will become part of this group. And you can see sort of this visualization uh, drawn to sort of highlight which markers are inside of that group. Uh, and on the group is where you can control these overall settings like pose stiffness and also behavior um, that, that will affect all of the markers inside the group. Uh, but then you can go in and optionally select individual markers and change the behavior or stiffnesses for those. In this case, the hip has an override, you know, it has this behavior kinematic. I'm going to set it to inherit, which is going to take the settings from the group. Uh, I remember the group is set to dynamic. So now we expect the whole character to, uh, to just fall to the ground. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, well, what I was about to do was set to self collide on. So I'll just enable self collisions. And that should, uh, well, first of all, uh, he is intersecting with, with his self at the moment. So we're going to get some funny behavior. Um, and that's because the clavicles are um, over, overlapping with the, uh, the head. So I'm just going to go in here to the manipulator, select these clavicles and just shorten them a little bit. Uh, and that's one of the one of the quirks. The, some of the, one of the things to keep to, to keep track of is that you don't really want self collisions uh, anywhere. And so one of the things you can do is you can you can just disable contacts on the clavicles altogether. In this case, it looks like there's something else self intersecting. Let me just take the whole torso and turn that off. Uh, let's see. So, oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the um, the arms uh, are also intersecting <laughs> with the with the upper body. So you could you could disable contacts on the arms so that they never overlap with anything. But I think in this case it's a good opportunity to uh, to demonstrate the uh, collision groups, or rather the uh, it's called an overlap group because anything part of the same overlap group can overlap. So in this case we want all of these three: the arm, torso, and the other arm. Uh, they should be able to overlap. So I'm going to give them an overlap group of, say, five. Uh, so now they will be colliding with other things, uh, so that the upper arms will still collide with the hip and the, the world and the head and, all, and so on, uh, but it will not collide with the torso, which is what you want. Uh, all right, so now we have self-collisions, uh, and we have him uh, fall to the ground. Uh, from here, there are a few other issues I noticed that, for example, the um, the shoulders are dropping. And in case, in this particular case, for this particular character, the clavicles can't actually rotate in this direction. Uh, because you notice that they are sort of, they're sort of pinned to this wooden, uh, so they can only rotate in this axis right here. Uh, we want to sort of prevent uh, any rotation uh, from happening outside of there. Uh, so I'll go, I'll go to the manipulator once more and select the clavicles. And uh, if I'm in symmetry mode, I'll be able to do this on both at the same time. Uh, so here you can see the, the limits, uh, which prevents rotations in uh, each, each of the three axes. So I'll just enable all of them so we can see what they look like. And you can see inside of here, uh, it's giving you this sort of visualization of this little cone. So you have one uh, to control the rotation in this axis, uh, and then rotation in this axis, and finally the rotation in the uh, in the y axis. In this case, we only want rotation in x. So I'm going to take the z and the y. I'm going to lock it. So now the uh, the x axis is the only axis that's allowed to rotate. The other ones are are prevented from it. And in case we can, uh, in this case we can just uh, we don't have to set a max or min for this. We can just let it be completely open, completely free. Like there's no limit on x. So x can rotate in you know however much in any any number of uh, degrees, um, but the other axes are locked. And when I drop him now, you can see that now he's falling a little more um, predictably. Um, but there is a number of other issues like um, his spine, like the lower legs are not supposed to rotate this much. So in this case, I'll go in here and just enable the basics. Uh, for the thighs, uh, the default is a pretty good value. Uh, but for the legs, uh, they are rotating a bit too much. And they're also collapsing, collapsing in on themselves. Uh, so I would just enable them here. In this case, we don't really want any rotation in this axis. I'm going to lock it. Uh, we don't want any rotation in this axis either. So I'm going to lock that too. 
Uh, for the leg, I don't want it to rotate forward. I only want it to rotate, say, from here and then up. Uh, so if I hold the control key, I can move one of these independently. Uh, so I want him to go about, about yay much. All right, so now he'll be able to, to fall, but he won't actually rotate his legs more than this amount, which is what we want. Uh, likewise for the spine, <laughs> it's also a bit much, so I'll just uh, keep adding limits. The feet are also uh, much too flexible, much too... Uh, yoga exercised so something like that should be fine and finally for the upper arm um, I would leave that for now the lower arm we also want to lock all the axes except in this case the Z axis and just like before I'm going to prevent uh, prevent it from going backwards all right there we go so now we have a, uh, a decent ragdoll character that you can drop from uh, most you know in most heights and it, he should drop and sort of behave uh, anatomically correct and and just like before this character will still try and follow the the pose so if he had animation on him uh, let's say at this point he uh, raised his legs if i just put the geometry back to referenced uh, if I were to go from here and I just raise the legs, as I do this, uh, he will do that while being on the ground. Uh, so I think this, this is one of the powerful things about Ragdoll, where you can have him drop with gravity and apply uh, the appropriate contacts and interact with the environment, but you still manage to, uh, to drive the character with your regular keyframes. And that's it. So then we have a, a basic overview of the, uh, the fundamental elements of Ragdoll. Uh, the rest is uh, some sprinkled sugar and some other cool things to accelerate this workflow. Um, uh, well, actually, before I go, there's uh, obviously the, the question of how actually do I actually drive my character rig with the simulation that I'm seeing here. Uh, and for that, you would go uh, right on record. So this record is essentially a bake. It will copy the simulation and just put it back onto the animation controls. So in this case, we can see how it did that copy and now now they both do what the simulation was doing from here uh, there really is no connection to ragdoll anymore you could hide the solver which hides absolutely everything about ragdoll uh, you can even delete it it doesn't really matter it, it gets baked it gets baked onto regular keyframes uh, and also onto an animation layer so it's a, it's a non-destructive record that you can then toggle on and off to sort of go back to where you were and maybe re-simulate if you needed to uh, like, for example, if I disable this layer, uh, I can go disabling the, the cache that was made as well. Uh, maybe I'll change it to here and then make another record. Uh, so now we have two variations of this um, ragdoll character that we can then toggle between. So here we have the, the first variation and the second variation. Uh, and as they are just regular keyframes, you can then export these uh, in any sort of regular Maya native animation format, like uh, the Atom format, for example.